This is your reality check. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. This is the show for July 9th, 2018, and I'm your host, Darren McKee. With me, as usual, are Adam Gardner. What's up, you boys? Christina Roach. Hey, everyone. And producer Pat. Hi, Jackers. We have a great show for you today. Pat is going to look into whether someone can open a plane door mid-flight. And then we have a special Five Minutes with an Astronomer with Stuart Robbins talking about parallax. And finally, Adam is going to look into whether the U.S. is the 10th most dangerous country to be a woman. But first, Christina would like to have a little correction. Thank you, Darren. A couple of weeks ago, I did a segment looking into whether Mexico World Cup fans really caused an earthquake as reported widely in the news. Now, during the segment, I mentioned an instance where a similar event was documented at a soccer game in UK's Leicester City, which I mistakenly pronounced Leicester. Thank you, Checker Tim, for tweeting at TRC underscore podcast to point out my error. My sincere apologies if we have any listeners in the area. In my defense, the word is spelled L E I C E S T E R. <laughs> and for the record, I double checked, and Worcestershire sauce is also the correct pronunciation, not Worcestershire. So I'll put that one in the kitchen of my memory palace so that I don't screw it up in the future. (laughs) (laughs) Nicely done. And to be fair, there's a street near me that looks like Gloucester, and it's Gloucester. Right. And every time I say it, I have to spell it out. So, Pat, you're taking a plane. You think, I don't want to just use the bathroom. I want to get some fresh air. Can you open the door to that plane (laughs) mid-flight? So I know, Christina, that you've done some work with Michael Rappaport. Darren, Adam, do you know who that is? I've heard the name forgotten uh, who he is yeah he's an actor who's in um so the first couple of saints row games that's probably not what he's best known <laughs> right he's an actor he's a podcaster he's a comedian he's, he's a director, a director. Yeah. he does a lot of things and one of the things that he's doing right now is being the sideline reporter for fox sports coverage of the big three basketball league this is a three-on-three basketball league which features mostly retired nba players and it was created by rapper and actor ice cube and it was on a flight from houston to la After the opening night of the Big Three League that Rap got his new nicknames, Rappaport Authority and Air Marshal Mike. (laughs) Here are a couple of headlines. TMZ. Mile High Hero saves airplane from emergency situation. (laughs) USA Today. Michael Rappaport is a hero. Stops man from opening plane emergency door. Perez Hilton. Michael Rappaport saves flight by stopping passenger from opening emergency door mid-air. So the story is that Rapp was in first class when a passenger started trying to open the door of the plane. He jumped up, asked the guy what he was doing, and then pinned him against the seat until other passengers, including some very large former NBA players (laughs) and someone from Ice Cube's security, came to help. Yeah, one of the guys was seven feet tall at least. Yeah. Okay, so nothing against rap. He's hilarious. And he's playing this story up in a very tongue-in-cheek way. He posted some really funny stuff about it on Twitter, including him rocking out to the lyrics, Did you ever know that you're my hero? From the, <laughs> from, the, from the song, Wind Beneath My Wings. And I have to say that if I was on the flight, someone tugging at the door, I would try and stop them too. As Douglas Moss, a pilot and airline safety expert, said in a Fortune article, A passenger who tries to open the door is demonstrating an unstable mental condition. It's hard to know what they're going to do next. But the question I have is, could someone actually open the door of a plane mid-flight? So this has happened. Have you guys ever heard the name D.B. Cooper? I have. Yes. No. So this is probably the most famous case where hijacker D.B. Cooper parachuted out of a Boeing 727 in 1971 after extorting $200,000 in ransom. He was never found. But there are two things to note about this case. Number one, Cooper had the pilot depressurize the plane. And number two, since that incident, the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, has mandated that planes with doors like the ones he jumped from be fitted with something called a Cooper vane or a DB Cooper device, obviously named after him, which locks the door when the plane is in flight. What an achievement to commit a crime that causes them to like change a regulation yeah. for you. I like to think I did that on easy board, but it's hard to <laughs> 
Yeah, what an accomplishment. You take that far enough, and then you get compared to Hitler. Right. Yes. So back to this emergency exit, this passenger on Rappaport's flight was trying to open, and the point about the plane being pressurized. Most passenger aircraft, which pressurize the cabin, have what is called a plug door. These doors are designed to seal themselves by taking advantage of difference in air pressure. The mm -hmm. inside of a passenger plane's cabin is set to have a much higher pressure than the air outside. According to Moss, the difference is eight pounds per square inch. Hmm. Common passenger doors are about six feet tall by three and a half feet wide. So Moss calculates that to open the door at cruising altitude, one would need to overcome more than 24,000 pounds of pressure, about the weight of six cars. Oh, wow. I read that below 8,000 feet it would be easier, but you'd still need superhuman strength. So Rap did the right thing by stopping this guy from tugging on the door, but there isn't really any chance that this passenger was going to get it open. All right, so since I'm talking about planes, I also wanted to address an article that friend of the show, Alex Murdoch, sent us. It got picked up by a bunch of news outlets, and it was the story of a Kelowna woman who claims that she and her son were hit by human waste that fell out of the sky from an airplane flying overhead. <laughs> I've heard this kind of thing before. Looking into it, this seems to be a thing that some people believe, that airplanes dump their sewage tanks mid-flight. Mm -hmm. All right, story time. When I was 19 years old, I worked for an airline. I was a ticket agent, but occasionally I would pick up extra shifts, quote, working the ramp. That's what we called being on the ground crew. One of the worst parts of that job was if you got stuck working the honey wagon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds nefarious already. Mm -hmm. This is a truck designed to empty out the lavatory of planes. Someone needs to go up on a lift and connect a hose to the waste tank, which is on the outside of the plane. There is no mechanism for a pilot to flush the tank mid-flight. Let's just say if you've ever been around when a ramp agent doesn't get that connection seated exactly properly, it can get really messy. Yeah. <sighs> so I can tell you firsthand that modern planes do not dump waste mid-flight. That's not to say it's impossible. Incidents of so-called blue ice were more common before the early 1980s. This was usually because of a leak. But the suction toilet was widely adopted in 1982, and it is much more reliable. Leaks can still happen, but it is extremely rare. According to the FAA, they still receive complaints, but these complaints tend to spike quite a bit in the fall, right around the same times that birds are migrating. Oh, what a coincidence. <laughs> so there you have it. That's funny. But isn't it blue sometimes? So prior to this suction toilet, basically planes had porta potties. And so they had all this blue liquid like they have in porta potties. But oh. since the suction toilet, that's not so much the case. The notion that an airplane would purposely drop human toilet waste? human waste, uh, that is just so ridiculous to me that anyone would believe this. Well, the way I'd heard it, which is not true, as Pat explains it, but the the way I'd understood it is that an airplane was meant to dump, like, when they were over the ocean, for example. But if someone sort of dumped at the wrong time, that's when that kind of thing could happen. Well, what I can tell you about modern airplanes is there's no mechanism for the pilot to do that. Yeah. So so that, that all just sounds like levels of ur urban legend, right. you know? Right, <laughs> yeah. Now, that might have been possible in the 40s or 50s, but, but certainly not in modern aircraft. Thanks, Pat. Good to know. Do you also want to tell us about Five Minutes with an Astronomer? So, long-time listeners will probably recognize the name Stuart Robbins. Dr. Stu is a planetary scientist who currently works on NASA's New Horizon mission. He's been on the show pretty much more than anyone else, 12 times, I think. He also hosts his own podcast called The Exposing Pseudo-Astronomy Podcast. So I've been dropping hints for a couple of years about doing a side project that's a crossover of our show and Stuart's, and a few months back, Stuart agreed to give it a try. So while he was visiting us up here in Canada, as he likes to refer to it, <laughs> we recorded season one of what we have called Five Minutes with an Astronomer, 
And it's exactly what it sounds like. We ask Stuart a question. He tries to answer it in under five minutes without a script. So the idea is that we will occasionally run episodes of the show as tier C segments, like we're doing today. But if you can't wait, we've also released the entire first season, 28 episodes, as a standalone show, which you can find wherever you get podcasts. So with all that said, this is an episode of Five Minutes with an Astronomer about Parallax. Welcome to 5 Minutes with an Astronomer, the show where we ask Dr. Stuart Robbins, a professional astronomer, about our universe. Each episode, we tackle one question and give Stuart the challenging task of helping us understand the topic in under five minutes without a script. I'm Pat Roach, and with me is Christina Fernandez. Hey, everyone. And of course, Stuart Robbins. Hey there, space fans. Stuart, are you ready for today's question? I am indeed. All right. I'll set the timer. Christina, can you please ask the question? I've heard you use a term, parallax. What is it, and why is it important in astronomy and planetary science? So let's start off with a simple do-it-yourself experiment. So everyone, unless you're driving or doing something else that requires <laughs> your utmost attention, like arc welding, I don't know, take your finger and put it out in front of you. This looks pretty funny. We should actually take a picture of it in the studio. <laughs> so put your finger out in front of you and line it up with a distant object, preferably one that's sort of straight up and down, like a telephone pole or a, a wall, a refrigerator, something else. Gotcha. Now close one eye, yep. then open it and close the other eye, and it will appear to jump. Yep. That's parallax. It is the simple phenomenon of how a foreground object will appear to move relative to a background object when that foreground object is viewed from a different location. So it's a pretty simple concept, and it's incredibly important in astronomy. The reason that it's so important in astronomy is that it lets us figure out the distance to other objects in the solar system or in the galaxy or in the universe that we can't get to by spacecraft or probe or some other means. So what we can do is we can, from Earth, look at a distant object against even more distant objects and measure how it appears to move relative to those even more distant objects if we observe it from a different location on the planet. So, for example, I'm sitting here in Toronto, and if I were to look at, say, the closest star to Earth that we can see from the Northern Hemisphere – against what we'll call the fixed background of even more distant stars mm -hmm. from here. And then if I were to go back home to Colorado and look at that same foreground object against the background of stars from there, if I had really, really precise measuring equipment, it would appear to move ever so slightly. Then, based on the distance between Toronto and where I live, we can easily Actually, it's very simple trigonometry that you'll learn in middle school. We can very easily figure out the distance to that foreground object. So it's using this basic geometric trigonometric principle that we have been able to measure the distances to literally billions of objects in our local neighborhood within the galaxy. And then because we can measure with really, really good precision and accuracy, the distance to those objects, we can use them as a basis for what's called the astronomical distance ladder. Now, before I get into that, I have a critical thinking question for you, almost a gotcha question, so <laughs> don't feel bad if you get it wrong. I gave the example when we started this episode with your two eyes are the baseline. They're two observation points. On Earth, when we're using something, two objects, to look at a very distant object in space to try to measure parallax, what do you think is the biggest baseline, the farthest separation between our two observation points that we can get? So to me, the obvious answer, and probably therefore the gotcha, is telescopes on either side of the planet. Christina? Could you use the Earth's orbit? Christina gets it again. So it's actually Earth's orbit. So every six months, we are on the opposite side of the sun, which means that we can get a baseline of, for you Canadians, about 300 million kilometers, or for Americans, about 186 million miles. And that's a much bigger baseline than the size of the planet itself. Right. The reason that we want a big baseline is that it lets us see a bigger movement of that foreground object against the, what again we'll call the fixed background of even more distant objects. Okay. So with your two eyes, 
you don't get much parallax, but it's good enough for depth perception in your everyday life. And so by using Earth's orbit, we can actually get stuff that's a lot farther away than we could get just by using two telescopes on opposite sides of the planet. Gotcha. And using that, we can get distances to these distant objects, which let us get the first rung of the astronomical distance ladder. The astronomical distance ladder, perhaps a topic for a future episode, it's what we use to figure out the distances to even farther and farther and farther away stuff. So we use parallax to get to distances to some types of standard stars, stars that have a set brightness. And we can use that set brightness to then look at those stars farther away. And because we know exactly how bright they're supposed to be versus how bright they appear – we know how far away they are because light follows what's called an inverse square law. So simply, uh, if you're two times farther away, it is going to be four times fainter. And then we can use those stars and distance galaxies to get us to another type of rung on the distance ladder and then another one, another one, another one, and measure distances all across the universe. All because parallax gets us to the closest stars in our galaxy. And that's why it is ridiculously important in astronomy and cosmology, basically modern cosmology would not exist without the concept of parallax. Now, it's also important in planetary science because we use the exact same principle to understand topography on other planets. If you don't have some sort of active ranging system like a laser to to figure out how long it takes a laser pulse to get from the spacecraft, ping off the ground and get back to the spacecraft, if instead you have a camera in orbit and you look at the same object from slightly different vantage points, you can use parallax in order to figure out the distance to that object, and then use parallax to figure out the distance to another object in the same pictures that you just took. And from this, you can build up a picture of the topography of other planets, even if you don't have some sort of active system like a laser, like I mentioned before. Right. So not only is parallax important in astrophysics, but it's also very important in how we actually design missions within our own solar system to measure other kinds of things. Hmm. So does that answer your question, Christina? Do you sort of have an idea of what parallax is now? So in a nutshell, parallax is when you're looking at an object from two different points, and based on its apparent movement, we're able to calculate its distance. And this is incredibly important in astronomy. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Cool. Cool. Might have taken a little longer than five minutes, but I think we still got it. Yeah. Five Minutes with an Astronomer is an educational resource provided as a crossover of Stuart Robbins' Exposing Pseudo-Astronomy podcast and members of the award-winning The Reality Check podcast. You can find out more about Stuart at podcast.sjrdesign.net. You can find The Reality Check at trcpodcast.com. And you can find our website at astronomyin5.com. Send any topic suggestions, questions, or feedback to info at astronomyin5.com. Thanks to Ann Pat. And now to Adam. Is the United States the 10th most dangerous place to be for a woman? A number of news articles recently have shared the results of a survey which attempted to rank countries as they related to women's issues. The shocking fact, which made headlines on CNN, CBS, and many other news outlets, was that the U.S. ranked 10th in the survey of the most dangerous countries for women. Is this really the case? How can this be? The Thompson Routers Foundation, which surveyed 548 experts on women's issues worldwide, did indeed rank the U.S. as the 10th most dangerous nation in terms of risk of sexual violence, harassment, and being coerced into sex. Note that this list included only the 193 United Nations member states. So, not every country, but a lot of them. But almost every country. The foundation stated quite clearly that the U.S. being placed on the list was largely due to the hashtag MeToo and Time's Up campaigns, which increased awareness of sexual violence and intimidation against women in the U.S. As many articles point out, the U.S. is the only Western country in the list, that being the only country not in Africa, Asia, or the Middle East. The list, in order, includes India, Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Yemen, Nigeria, and finally, the United States of America. Articles on the topic don't give much in the way of specifics as to why the U.S. is listed so high in this list amongst other countries with seemingly much more serious problems with women's rights and the dangers they might face. To me, the reasoning for the ranking seemed quite odd. 
the entire point of the hashtag me too and times up movements should be to shed light on these issues and in doing so discourage them. If it's really true that the U.S. is only now in the top 10 and wasn't before, should this not be an indicator that the world of hashtag me too and times up is a world which is actually much worse off than it was before? Is this foundation arguing that things are worse than ever? Or is it that things have always been terrible, but before people spoke up, we were blissfully ignorant of what was really going on? When other countries potentially have tons of unspoken stories of assault and harassment against women without their own hashtag activism to shine light on them. So to me, this kind of ranking didn't seem totally called for, but we have to see what they're really doing here. So breaking down the survey results more specifically, we see that the U.S. actually stands out in one category, and that is that the U.S. ranks third in sexual violence. They are behind only India and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Wow. That seems so suspicious to me. Yes. So four to ten are the Syrian Arab Republic, Congo, South Africa, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Mexico, Somalia, and Egypt. So I wondered, what are the data points being used? How exactly can we know it's just that bad in the U.S., or for that matter, better in any of these other countries? After all, if the methodology to put the U.S. on this list isn't actually evidence-based, that actually means that the entire list, not just that 10th entry, is actually suspect. Well, the data source is simple, if we can call it that. It was a survey of experts. Now, we don't know of what the 548 individual experts used to come up with their ranking. And who are these experts? Well, the Thomson Reuters Foundation describes them as experts focused on women's issues, including aid and developmental professionals, academics, health workers, policymakers, non-government organization workers, journalists, and social commentators. It's kind of a mixed bag. They simply gave these experts a poll. They were asked about health care, discrimination, cultural traditions, sexual violence, non-sexual violence, and human trafficking. Some of these supposed experts may indeed have used specific data in order to best estimate a ranking of countries using the, these categories, using very specific metrics, which can be logically considered to represent what would make a country better or worse at any one category. Since the survey was said to have been given online, by phone, and in person, it isn't clear that many of the respondents would have been given enough time to make a calculated judgment. Some may have gone with feelings based off of what they see in the news, off of trends they see on Twitter, off of what their astrological reading meant, or pretty much anything. We don't actually know their methodology. We don't really know, but by the very fact that the report singles out the very public hashtag me too and Time's Up movements, it seems like how publicized these issues might be was surely a factor. The news in general is not a great way to give a person a true reflection of what's going on in the world. We're biased to consider the news we hear to be a bigger issue than it is, and the news is biased to report on extreme and noteworthy cases. That's just kind of the nature of news. It's what's new. It's not what's old. In this case, there has been a massive focus on sexual assault and harassment in the U.S. from highly publicized accounts, many from prominent celebrities, but also from a massive number of women everywhere speaking up that they too have been the victim of often unreported behavior. It seems like these accounts may easily account for an impression amongst the public and experts working in journalism, social commentary, and other areas that the situation in the U.S. is getting worse when in reality the movement sheds light on a problem which has been there for quite a while. So... How exactly do these lists line up with reality? This is something I wanted to check. Well, unfortunately, this is actually very difficult to tell. That the U.S. ranks third in sexual violence isn't something which can easily be compared to other countries. Statistics for murder, for example, are generally fairly reliable because a murder usually leaves a body, so you can count it. Statistics for rape and sexual violence, on the other hand, are much harder to measure. A victim needs to come forward and make a report to the police to be recorded. This can be affected by a number of factors, such as the woman's confidence that her complaint will be taken seriously and the consequences of the report. In some countries, such as India, South Sudan, and Yemen, marital rape is not considered a criminal offense. In many countries, this has only been considered illegal in recent years. In Afghanistan, which is ranked seventh in the survey of sexual violence, the U.S. being a third, Women may become the victim of an honor killing if they admit to being raped, or if they come forward, they could be charged with adultery and then sentenced to death. <sighs> so I'm not sure we're going to get great statistics out of Afghanistan. In Sudan, if a case of rape cannot be proven, the person who filed the case may risk being found guilty of sodomy or adultery, which are illegal, and again could incur the death penalty. So indeed, the U.S. ranks fairly high in some lists of countries ranked by rates of rape, but this isn't really a useful metric because those countries where you have 
realistic numbers probably are countries that have a different view on rape than some where you just can't get numbers at all. No doubt any amount of rape is a problem, and I do not mean to say that sexual assault in the U.S. is not a problem simply by questioning its ranking in this very subjective survey. What we can say with some confidence is that rates of rape in the U.S. are in decline. The National Crime Victimization Survey showed that the per capita rate of rape has declined from 2.4 per 1,000 people, 12 and older, in 1980, to 0.4 per 1,000 people, 12 and older, in 2003. And I recently read Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now, and he talks about rape in that. And, and pretty much over time, from earliest recorded history, rape has reduced worldwide and in the U.S. Now, the types of surveys like that done by the National Crime Victimization Survey attempt to measure rates of rape uh, as they may not be reported to authority. So if you only go with police statistics, that doesn't give you a great picture. Now, this doesn't address the question of whether or not the U.S. is the third in sexual violence, but what it does tell us is that 2018's hashtag MeToo and Time's Up Aware United States of America is actually in a significantly better place than the 1980s era when people weren't talking about it. Surely people not reporting assaults can complicate the data, but in this case we would expect a rise, not a reduction, in the rates of sexual assault in light of movements which are shedding light on those cases. Now, we don't have a great way to rank countries with regards to danger to women, or more specifically, in this case, sexual violence against women. Surely some researchers could use specific methodologies to try to get an idea of that answer. Alternatively, you can just survey people. While there is potentially some value in surveying supposed experts, in this case, it seems as if the results of the Thomson Reuters Foundation survey are more influenced by what is highly publicized in the news than the reality of what's going on in the world. All considered, I think the current trend of people publicly voicing their stories of harassment and assault is a good one. It makes people aware of how common this kind of behavior is and reminds people that it is not acceptable. As common as such behaviors may be, they are generally considered to be deplorable amongst most people, and the current movements are further reflections of an increasing distaste amongst the American people against such things. The same cannot be said about the attitudes towards women and sexual assault in many countries. I'm certainly not an expert on women's issues, according to the Thompson Reuters Foundation, but it seems likely that more than two United Nations member states could be said to hold worse opinions about women and sexual assault than the countries uh, which saw the rise of these movements. Well said. I'm just thinking availability bias. Yeah. Like, oh, we just asked a bunch of people what they thought. And like, well, does the United States come to mind? Of course it does. Of it's the most it predominant does. country in the world for almost everything. Yeah. It's, it's, it's potentially the country I live in. I mean, they surveyed people from around the world, but yeah, it's in the news. That's what you're hearing about, obviously. That's what people see as the problem. And it's good that they're aware of that problem, but let's not ignore what's going on in other countries, which can be pretty terrible. Thanks, Adam, for great coverage of a difficult topic. And thank you for joining us once again. Pat told us that you really probably shouldn't be concerned about someone trying to open a door mid-flight unless they look like they can lift about six cars. And in an episode of Five Minutes with an Astronomer, Stuart explained to us why parallax is so important to astronomy and cosmology. And finally, Adam looked into a stat of whether the United States is the 10th most dangerous country to be as a woman. And while there are numerous problems in the United States, it doesn't make sense it's on the list of 10 if we look at most countries on Earth. Until next time, think better to act better. Peace out, cute boys. Stay classy, not smartassy. We'll talk to you next week, everyone. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. Mm-hmm.